line of League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. We are a non-partisan, non-profit organization. We do not support <coughs> particular candidates, although we have positions on different issues. And we have women and men among our members, and we are really glad that you all are here to hear from the McPherson Housing Coalition. We have Chris Goodson, Executive Director, and Carolyn Moore, the Director of Supportive Services, and they're going to talk about the innovative approach that McPherson has come up with to deal with their unhoused populations and homeless people. So, let's welcome Carolyn and Chris. Well, thank you for having us here today. What an important group you are. I don't know that you realize, you probably do realize how important it is what you're doing. And, and you know, just think how many years ago we couldn't even vote, so now here we are. So that's really exciting for me to think about that. So my first housing coalition was actually founded in 2008 um, to provide affordable housing in our community and little did we know it was going to explode into this crazy homelessness supportive services situation. Um, I thought I would start off by giving you some stats. I don't know if you've seen any of these before but I thought it was really important. You know when you're in school and they say define the problem? Well that's the first thing you really need to do is understand what you're even dealing with. So we kind of put these together really fast. Is it okay to take pictures of Take pictures things? of whatever you want, yes. I think she's going to be filmed. She's filming and she'll have some stuff as well. But yes, take, the, take pictures. But I, I thought I'd go over those. And the reason that you see small and then larger is because I want you to kind of see how this thing is escalating. So 7.6% of people in the state of Kansas are in poverty. That's over 73,000 people in poverty. That's not including people who are just above the fray, and they're actually a very vulnerable population because they don't qualify for anything. One little thing happens and they're kind of done for. Um, then you look at housing cost burden. So do you guys know what that is, housing cost burden? Every single person in this room should not be paying more than 30% of their income toward their housing costs. So if you were to go to a bank and say, I want to buy this house and the, and the rents or the mortgage is going to be 50% of my, they're not giving you that. They will not give you that. But yet we have people in poverty who are paying over 50% of their income toward their housing costs. And then we wonder why we have a problem. Did you know that one in six kids in the state of Kansas go hungry? Um, Carolyn and I did a talk actually um, this summer and I was doing some work on finding some statistics. And that just is my modeling to me that in the state of Kansas, one in seven kids are going hungry. I mean, we're the place where they're growing all the food for everybody else. How are our kids going hungry? Parents are paying $800 per child per month for daycare. So already you're paying over 30% of your income toward your housing costs. Parents can't feed their kids. And now we're trying to figure out how to do take daycare. And then you look at 250,000 Kansas black health insurance. And people will say, well, what do you mean? We have different opportunities or whatever. And it's like, no, they can't, they can't go onto the portal because it's, too, it's still too expensive for them. I know people personally who have no health insurance. Mm -hmm. So now we have to decide, do I feed my kids? Do I go to the doctor? Do I get the medicine that they need? How do I make this work? And then we have 2,800 people experiencing homelessness in 2024. So now you kind of see pretty simply how this is happening. With, especially with our families, which is what we, we help everyone, but we really do focus on our families. And this is the other thing that really gets people that they really don't understand. The overall cost to the community is over $35,000 per person who's homeless per year. And that has to do with, they use the emergency room for the doctor. They're not able to pay their bills. Um, there's eviction notices for, for the courts. There's all kinds of things going on and so that, that is really showing us what the road looks like. There's the road right in front of us. And that's what we all need to understand is that's how we got there. So how is McPherson Housing Coalition um, combating this problem? So we have six major um, programs that we have. We have Rush Up Matt County that I'll talk, and we'll talk about each one of these in a little bit. Rush Up Matt County, um, which is a program that helps seniors stay in their homes. Um, we have a tenant-based rental assistance program, which we'll talk about. An emergency solutions grant, that's really what funds our emergency shelter and some other programs. A community services block grant, which actually helps provide 
um, services for people that live within our shelter. Again, we're going to talk about each one of these. And then case management, which is where one of our people in our office that is trained goes in and works with our families. So we're not just throwing them out there and saying, here you go, figure it out. And then, of course, we develop and build all kinds of housing. So the first program that I'm going to talk about today is the Brush Up MAC program. Once a year, this is a 20-year program. We've been around for 20 years on this particular program. Um, kids from the colleges, from the high schools, different philanthropic groups, lots of churches come together. We go out into the community. We build wheelchair ramps. We uh, clean up yards. Um, this year, I believe, we had a lady whose husband had passed away like seven or eight years earlier. She was not able to maintain the property very well. And our crews took 18 loads to the dump of leaves and debris. So you can only imagine what is going on with this house with all kinds of creatures living in the yard and what it's doing to the neighbors. So this is a great program. Um, people sign up every single year. It's mostly geared toward seniors who own homes. We've been able to paint, we do all kinds of things. So it keeps our seniors safe and in their homes. And we're currently in um, the town of Inman, the town of Lindsburg. And there's eight communities in McPherson County. So McPherson, Inman, and Lindsburg are where we are right now. Yeah. Um, it works best when you get volunteers from that community to do the work on houses in that community. Um, and I think uh, last year we had somewhere around 250, well, I say last year, because it was August, it was April. Um, 250 volunteers and we tackled 28 houses. So it's, it, it, it's really good, these people involved. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna let you take over. Okay. okay, the next program that we have is tenant-based rental assistance. And basically what this does is um, people who are struggling, they are not, getting their rent paid every month and they are struggling every month. They'll reach out to me. They're not about to be evicted. They don't want to be evicted. And um, so what we're able to do is come in and I take a look at what their income is and how many kids they have in their household. They don't have to have kids. You could be um, just an elderly couple, but I come in, I look at your income. I figure out, okay, what is 30% of your income? And that is what they pay. And then the TVRA program pays the rest. So there's a formula that I have to follow on that. Um, this is the only program we currently have where you don't, we don't focus on you having children. Um, our heart has always been to get the kids that, whose families are struggling, get them stable, get them housed, help them figure out how to be more stable. Um, our thought is you have to stop that trauma. And every time there's an eviction, there's trauma. Um, the Emergency Solutions Grant, as Chris said, this program uh, basically pays to keep the lights on and the staff at our emergency shelter cottages. We're going to show you what those look like. But um, <clears throat> basically, uh, this, this grant has three components. One of them is homeless prevention. This would be where you have actually received an eviction notice court order eviction notice, which means your landlord has already started that process, there's money they've already paid, but the family will reach out to me and if that landlord wants to keep them as tenants, then I can step in and help pay the portion of the rent that they are just falling behind on and give them stable. If I have the funding, I can work with them for up to two years. Personally, I feel like we want to get this solved within six to nine months. Something about what you're doing to earn your income needs to change. So either a different job, more hours, what does that look like? Um, then we have rapid rehousing, and as that states, basically these are homeless folks who now need to be housed as quickly as we can get them. And before we built our shelter, this was the only program I had. And you're going to see very quickly how it kind of did not work the way it was anticipated to work. Um, but there's a homeless family. They have children. I find a landlord that will rent to them. I get them housed. I can pay their um, deposit, first month's rent. I can pay utility deposits. Um, get them housed. Then there's no supportive services. So here you are. Whatever's been going on has caused your instability. 
Good luck with that. I'll help you with your rent, and we'll try to make this work out. And again, it can last up to two years if there's funding. And then the third component is to pay for the homeless shelter. Now, when we started thinking about our cottages and the emergency shelter cottages that we built, this money, there was no money to build it. Um, now, they actually have funds for another organization to come in and say, we want to do what they did. They'll give them money to build it. But they, we didn't have that. We had to do it on our own. Um, community service block grant. This one is tied to the people that are in my um, Oak Harbor cottages. Basically, this money allows me to hire an attorney. I am blown away. I am in my 60s. I don't think I'm that old. But I am amazed from when I was growing up, high school, newly married, the number of people that hook up with somebody, they're living together, they have children, they have a family, and they never get married. So if they split up, who gets the kids? Whoever takes them, whoever wants them. Um, there is no legal obligation for child support because there's nobody that has custody of the kids. Um, you can have mom that had them, and pretty soon it gets really frustrating, and so she takes them to dad and she drops them on the front porch and says, it's your turn, you get them now. That's what's happening to the kids in, in our, across our country. But, um, so one of the first things I love to do is if I have a situation like this, it's like, okay, you gotta go see an attorney, we have to get custody of the kids. Part of your long-term stability is that you're receiving child support. There's an order there that makes this other parent be responsible, whether that's male or female, we've had both. Single fathers, single mothers, but you gotta have that child support. Your child deserves that support. Um, we can uh, get them mental health counseling. I can pay the copay that they would have or the fee they would have if they don't have insurance. I can pay for them to see a medical doctor. I can get them in to see a dentist. You know, it's really hard to go to work when you're face is swollen and you, or you're hurting. Um, maybe you can, you've got a problem with that knee. You don't know what's going on, but it you know makes it hard to work. So we want to get them the support services, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about support services. We want to get those supports in place so that we can get you as stable as possible so you can have a full-time job. This will also help us with childcare. Childcare is really expensive, and um, if you're working part-time, um, that can be all that you end up paying for. So again, you have to have a job that will allow you to be able to pay for your child support, or pay for your child care, and, um, and feed your family and house and all that stuff. Um, another thing that this will allow us to do, right now in McPherson County, we currently only have a um, public transportation that is a bus. The senior center has a bus. It will pick you up and take you where you need to go. You call ahead of time, try to get that scheduled. <coughs> taxi. So we have families that live in Inman, and they can't get to McPherson for their job. We have families that are in Lindsburg. They, they have to find a ride because there's no public transportation to get between these eight communities. So that can be an issue sometimes. And then, as Chris said, the final part of this is case management. Um, Sherry Rickerson there in the kind of a green top, she's our case manager. And one of the first things she does is ask them, why are you homeless? Why are you struggling? What's going on? Um, I always tell people, don't lie to me. I can deal with whatever you tell me. Nothing you tell me is going to surprise me, but I can't help you with it if I don't know about it. So tell me about it. And um, the library just put in these glassed-in cases um, with the door so they're soundproof. You can have a conversation. Still, there's tears. There's, all, you know, people are embarrassed. They think they're the only one or they can't figure it out. So our case manager helps them then uh, figure out a stability plan. Um, each family is different. Their situation that brought them to us may be similar, but um, their road out of where they are is going to be different than the, than the next person. I will point out as well, go back to that, see the one on the right next to Sherry, she's actually an intern from K-State Salina. 
So we've partnered with them. They send interns to us, and we help train their social workers. So that's really fun for us to be able to, to get the next generation coming forward and um, being able to help. So we get them, they're very invested in what we do. We take them to Topeka when we do advocacy. They get to, they get to help figure out a case with a family. So we have them in all parts of everything that we do. So that's really, I, I love that myself, to be able to get the, the next generation to care about other people. But anyway, so we're looking at catastrophic. So what is this? What is the road to homelessness? A lot of people, especially in the political realm, they'll say, well, it's drug addiction. It's, it's alcoholism. Well, if I was homeless, I probably would turn to something like myself. But really, that's not what it is. A lot of times, you saw in the very beginning where I showed you all those statistics of all that different stuff, and you can see especially how a family can easily fall into homelessness. But there's other reasons. Um, domestic violence is a big one. We actually partner with a domestic, a couple of domestic violence um, partners. So they meet with the family, they make sure they're safe, and then we'll work with them. But we always have to make sure that they're safe first. We don't want to put, put anybody, our, our staff, in any kind of danger because we're working domestic violence. Loss of employment is a big one. Sometimes some of these big employers will lay people off, and they have no more employment. They have no employment, which even in our community, we have tons of jobs, but there are specific types of jobs that they do seem to get laid off on a regular basis. We had a situation where there was a family of four who lived in a home, their rental property, and the house next door caught on fire, and it was so hot that it melted the side of their house, um, completely melted the siding off, caused damage to their apartment. They went to the Red Cross, they put them in a place for like a week, and then they were going to be homeless. And we, we called them, I said, hey, call the Red Cross, and said, hey, they can't find a place to live in a week. I mean, they need deposits, and they need this, and they need that. They're homeless, not safe to go back to. And so um, they couldn't help, unfortunately. So we, we put them in the cottages. And a quick, very quickly, those boys who were autistic were able to calm back down. And, and then they were able to be successful. So the road to homelessness, we always talk about that because people with trauma have what they call a trauma brain and a lot of times they cannot think straight. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you've got all this stuff coming at you, you're trying to figure out how to take care of your kids and where am I gonna find this money and this is gonna happen and that. So they just need someone to, to throw the life raft so that they can get back on their feet and move forward. Mm -hmm. So th this is what we're really proud of. These are our Oak Harbor Cottages Emergency Shelter. I don't know, if it, have you guys heard of that? I know a couple of you have heard us talk before. Have you guys heard of it? Have any of you seen them? Uh, under construction. Oh, yeah. you've seen them under construction. So we're very proud of this. Um, this was built by our local churches. They came into our community and we said, would you be willing to build a house and pay for it? And they said yes. So each one of the cottages is named by the church, so they're called one is called Jamie's House. She actually was working on this project and unfortunately passed away in the middle of it. Um, we have um, the, Oak, the Lighthouse. One of them, the Colderman Mennonite Church built one called the Lighthouse. These names are incredible to me. Peaceful Oak is one. They all have really meaningful names. They came in, they all had contractors within their church body, and they came in, they built it, and they paid for it. And we were able to get them up for about $50,000 a piece, or just underneath. The families, um, the church would come in and they furnished them and then they got to decorate them however they wanted. So we're going to show you some photos about what these look like. So this is the cool thing. So a family comes to us, they're homeless. Um, we say, okay, we can provide you a place to live. It's fully furnished. And then we're going to wrap you with services. You're going to talk to our case manager, case manager and then we're going to get you. We're going to get this figured out for you and move you, move you along the path. Now, it's only 90 days. They only get to stay there for 90 days. And people say, well, what happens after 90 days? That's not very long. Well, we have other programs that actually allows them to move forward at that point. So anyways, but that's our, so that there's a washer and dryer in each one of the units because they don't have cars. How are they supposed to get the washer and dryer um, done? So go back a little bit. Okay, those bunk beds, that's in one of the bedrooms. Every, every one of our cottages has a bunk bed in one of the rooms so that you can get the kids' beds. The kitchen is fully stocked. Everything that they could possibly need from dish soap to um, tableware to whatever they need to be able to live comfortably in that house. You can see in the bathroom there's towels and shampoo and all of those type of things. We've had um, moms come in and now a lot of times the kids are with grandparents till she can get a place. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we had one mom come in and she saw the kitchen and she just started crying. And she's like, you mean I can cook here? It's like, yes, you can cook. You can cook for your family again. Um, we will bring them in and most of the time when they see what we're offering them, they just start crying because they can't, well, first of all, they can't believe that they're gonna be able to do this and that everything they need is there. So we also have a pantry. I didn't include a picture of it, but we have a pantry. So if you come to us and you've been living in your car, maybe you're not working, maybe that loss of a job was what caused you to lose your housing, um, we can feed you until you can get a job and start feeding yourself. So that's the first thing we want them to do is be able to feed their family. Get your kids stuff that they'll eat. I don't know about anybody else's kids, but when mine were little, they were picky, picky, picky. And so um, we try really hard in our pantry to make sure that we, and this is going to sound terrible, I don't mean it to be that way, not the average food pantry. Like, I want my parents to come in and be able to get stuff their kids are going to eat. Mm -hmm. And so we try to make sure we have fruits and vegetables. We try to make sure there's dairy there. And they, you know, they really can start eating like I do right. in my house. And they can't always cook either, so we do have to keep the foods pretty simple. A lot of our yeah. families have never learned how to cook or how to prepare a meal mm -hmm. or how to do a roast or yeah. any of that stuff. Yeah, if mom didn't teach you how to cook, then that's something you have to learn on your own. And I hate it that we um, have kind of discontinued the home ec in our, in our schools because a lot of times, I mean, that's where I learned how to sew. I don't sew now, but <laughs> that was how I learned how to do it, and I can if I need to. So what we help with then, like I said earlier, we help with transportation, we help them find a job. I do have employers that will reach out to me and say, hey, we've got this position opening up. Do you have anybody in your cottage that's looking for work right now? Um, we help them with education. Uh, in McPherson, and I think this is probably everywhere, there is an agency someplace close that will help this person if they didn't graduate high school to get their GED or work on getting their diploma. A lot of people think you have to pay for that. It's free. You just have to go. You have to participate. Um, legal assistance, like I said, we have community partnerships with over 40 other nonprofits or agencies in McPherson to help give people what they need. I am not a mental health counselor, but the people at Prairie View are amazing. They do great work. I can't diagnose what's going on with your child in that rash, but let's go see Grace, people at Grace Med. They can do that. So we partner with all these different agencies to help people with whatever it is they're needing. So as I said, our job is to get them house stable. And so at, towards the end of their 90 days, sometimes they actually have gotten a job at Pfizer or Certainty or one of our manufacturing and they don't need our help. So then it's just a matter of finding, helping them find a place that will um, be big enough for their family getting them moved in, and um, I also help with another organization, one of our partners called Outreach McPherson. They give furniture free to families that need it. They take it as donations from people that no longer need it. We give that out, help them. It's hard to move somebody into a house when they have nothing to sit on, mm -hmm. nothing to sleep on. Um, so we partner with that group to help with that. Um, <clears throat> we continue through with them, even though they're out of our cottage now and housed with that attorney. Sometimes it takes a while for that to be done. We continue to help pay for that. Um, and then, like I said, we, if they can't do it on their own and they need our help, we um, have one of our other programs through the um, Rapid Rehousing that will allow us to help them with their rent and their utilities. So one of the community <coughs> benefits, I think this is the thing when you're trying to explain to people about, about why it's important that we help people in poverty. It's important because it's the right thing to do, but it's also important because there are a lot of community benefits. Increased employment, like I showed you before, if you're a single mom and you're trying to figure out how to balance child care and housing costs and medical <coughs> care and other things, it's kind of hard to have a job. So you're relying on other people or the, or the social welfare system to make that work. So by doing this, we get people back to work. 
And then we help them figure out, do they need a high school diploma? Do we need to do that? So now you can choose this job over here. But before, they couldn't even have that job because they didn't have a diploma. You know, I would say 90% of our families do not have diplomas. A lot of our single moms who are did not finish high school, which makes it very difficult for them. So, and then, and then we also lower costs to the hospital. People are using that, like we talked before, as an emergency room. Now they actually get to see a doctor and a dentist and all those different things. And of course, the food, the, cat, the food and cash assistance goes down with the, because we've got them stable. They don't need assistance anymore. And that's the greatest thing when somebody says, she goes and talks to somebody, or, or Sherry talks to somebody, and they say, I don't need you anymore. I'm good. I mean, that is the most wonderful, wonderful feeling. She was telling me today, and she hasn't told this story yet, but we have a couple moms in our, our cottages are full, by the way. Ten of them. They're full. Uh, we don't have a waiting list that I know of, but we are full. And we have, they have front porches on them, and two moms were sitting on one of the porches talking to each other while their kids were playing in the yard. I mean, that's like the most heartwarming story, and that doesn't sound like anything that complicated, but for two moms in trauma, that's a huge step forward, <laughs> that together they're building community, so that, and that, that also helps the community when we start getting people out of their trauma and they can move forward and be able to um, then be successful. And also, kids perform better in school. Do you know how difficult it is to be pulled out of school constantly? You know, and in our community, we only have, there's only four grade schools, I think. So it's not quite as bad, but it's still hard. You're in a new school, you have a new teacher, you have new friends every single year. It's really hard for them. They're, they're, they're the ones who usually have the problems. They're the ones who can't sit still in school. They're the ones who have, who act out. They're the ones who get bullied and all that type of thing. So, all of these things that we're doing not only helps our families move forward, but it also has huge community benefits. And these are the things that we need to continue talking to our legislators about. Here's why we're doing this. It, 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 you might be saving, you might be spending money on the front end, but on the back end, you're saving a lot of money. And so our next building project um, is the Sutherland Estates. That is these seven houses here. This is the emergency shelter, so these are just to the north. These are one, two, and three bedroom. But if you look at that, the footprint is not that much different than the emergency shelter. The one bedrooms, we're going to have two of those. Eventually, we might have 12 here, but our two bedrooms, we'll have, or two one bedrooms, we're picturing our elderly, people that are getting priced out of their rental because it keeps going up, but their fixed income is staying the same. Um, then there's the two bedroom. So for the one bedroom, I wish we had the floor plan, floor plan but yeah. for the one bedroom, what we've done, same size cottage as the emergency shelter. We made the adult bedroom just a little bigger, and we made the second, what would be the second bedroom in our cottages, a little smaller. It's a pantry, it's a place for your um, washer dryer, that's where the hot water heater is, and it's where the back door is. So, you know, it's still a usable space, but it's small. The two bedrooms, we um, made the living space, kitchen, front room, about three foot wider. So keep in mind, these are only 480 square feet. They're small, they're small. Um, but the two bedrooms, all we did was make it just a little bigger in the living area. And then the three bedrooms, they have a basement underneath them. Two bedrooms and a bath in the basement, <coughs> as well as that's where your mechanical room is. Um, underneath the stairs, we left that open because I'm picturing kids sitting on a chair playing their video game or maybe they're hiding underneath there. Or maybe there's Christmas decorations, they need a place to store those. They are very small. But the families that live here will also meet with the case manager. They will be able to receive the support services that we're offering to the families that are in our cottages. These will be families who are what they consider chronically homeless, meaning that in the last year you've been homeless four or more times. So picture your life, you're going about your stuff, and you find yourself homeless. What you took with you when you left was what you could carry or stick in the car, include your kids. Things go bad, better again, we get housed. Oh. Two months later, we're homeless again. We have families that cycle this way. So part of our goal is to stop that cycling and get them stable. 
which again should improve the local economy, should improve the kids, uh, how they're doing in school, just the overall stability of families. A lot of times when you hear of permanent supportive housing, it's for veterans. They need it, do it, mm -hmm. give them what they need. Or our elderly live in it like a community. They can pull a cord if they need help with something. Um, this will be the first permanent supportive housing with a focus on families. We're gonna have six three bedroom homes in this development when it's done. At 48, 480 square feet. Oh, well, take a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The three bedrooms, 480 on the top floor plus a basement. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, what you showed us earlier was 480 feet. So, yeah. this little cottage was 480 yeah. square feet. Now, we, when we did the floor plans, I had a friend who kind of lived in a tiny home, and she said, Oh, you can't have a wall there. You can't put a couch in front of that. So we took it to people that we knew that lived in smaller homes and said, okay, tell us what to do. And they're like, we'll get rid of this wall and shut that down and do this. So it made it a lot more open. I mean, it's all open. They're really cute. They feel big, like you said. You, you said you were in them while they were under construction. So you haven't been in them since they're, they've been finished. Right, right. Yeah, we would invite you to come it's down awesome. if you're interested in yeah. seeing mm -hmm. how all this works together. But so community impact. So the person Housing Coalition adds $3 million of economic impact to the community every single year. And that has to do with our construction dollars. Um, anytime we do a project, we try to keep everything local. So our contractors are local, our building materials are local. Everything that we can buy from the local community, um, we do. We try to keep it locally. So that way we're continuing to spur that economy. And that's what's really important. And I think I do really feel like on the legislative side that that's the thing that we need to continue to put, put out there is we are adding to the local community. community and this is really good for us. And again, it's through our construction project. Increased property values, our brush up MAC program can double and triple the value of a house. Mm -hmm. In Lindsburg, that's one of our programs. It's, they call it Lift Up Lindsburg, but it is mm -hmm. kind of, it's part of our program. They, they really embarrass us because they will take a house and their volunteers will completely redo it. I, we don't do a lot of painting in McPherson, but in Lindsburg, which is part of our program, they, those houses, the one of the houses, the very, the blue house in the what she awesome. was doing was actually a Lindsberg house that was, I actually worked on that project. That house was terrible. And when they got done, I was like, wow. So, so we do increase property values, which again, helps the county, helps the community, helps everybody. If you have somebody in your neighborhood who's now improving their, their home, well, maybe you want to do something, or maybe that person wants to do something. So it, it brings our neighborhoods back to life. And then also the stabilization cost savings when you're not using the emergency room and all of that. And then we have increase in um, family income. We usually increase by 100 to 200 percent with our families by the time from where they're at now to where they end up. Well, of course, now we can afford daycare. We can afford those things because we've been able to help them through the process to get their income increased. That's really important. The lack of housing and being able to get their family income up is really, really important. And so now something fun that we've started doing, as if what we're doing isn't enough, <laughs> we are doing a podcast. You can find us on any of the streaming services. It's called Housing for Good. And what we're doing is we are inviting people to come have a conversation with us about housing, about the services that you offer. So we have spoken with the Chief of Police, Michael Golden, and we said, talk to us about what your police officers are seeing when it comes to homeless people in the community. Um, is there, I don't know if you guys have heard or not, but a while back there was a grants pass versus, I don't remember the lady's name, Johnson maybe? Johnson. Yes, Johnson. And uh, in grants pass, Oregon, the court ruled that you can arrest homeless people for sleeping outside. Okay, well, let's, Let's play that out a little bit. What does that look like? So now you've just taken somebody that's homeless, they're probably not working because it's hard to keep a job when you're homeless, and so there's no income, and you just put them in jail where now they have a $350 ticket, and they have to go up here in court. And guess what? They're still homeless. You're not doing anything but making this person a criminal now, and so we wanted to talk about that. What does that look like in McPherson County? Are you hearing anybody across the state of Kansas doing that? 
Um, we spoke with a couple of women from Prairie View. Uh, Prairie View and Newton, they have a housing uh, development. We want to know what, what do you do to help people with their housing? I know you're giving them mental health services, but what does it look like for you to house them? Who qualifies for that service? Um, we had a meeting with um, our um, Meals on Wheels director. I was surprised at how many people this woman is feeding every single day. When she started, it was like 40 to 50. Now it's 80 people every day. I, I know the work I do. I cannot imagine what she does to pull that off every single day. And then we talked about, okay, so for the folks that you're taking those meals to, they're seniors, what's their housing look like? What are people telling you that this person is struggling? If they're struggling with their meals, there's got to be other struggles. What are you hearing? Um, we, she did say, can, oh, really loudly on the podcast, oh. <laughs> can the landlords please fix the steps because I'm going to kill myself trying to get into this house. I mean, she's seeing yeah. that every single day. Yeah. That was like... Okay, who was one of your favorite ones we've done so far? I liked, um, so we had Cody Ryerson from the Boundaries, oh, yeah. he's the superintendent, and he talked about, he actually had somebody that worked for him that was homeless. He found out about it and he said, you know what, there's a place at the school, if you need a place to sleep and you can take a shower. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, what kind of a boss, I hope I'm this kind of a boss, what kind of a boss that would you feel comfortable telling them, I wouldn't tell my boss that I was homeless and I was struggling, but what an incredible person that he was, they were willing to go to him and explain to them what was going on for her and her kids. And he made sure that he could figure out a way to help that family. The other thing that they're doing that I just loved is this little town of Mound Ridge, they realized they have people struggling with childcare. We have a building over here that we're not using. We don't need it for any of our preschool right now. What would happen if we turned that into a place for there to be childcare given? What if, what if the school district can help with that? So there's some, some thoughts going on to how to tackle some of the issues that people are facing. Um, we tell everybody on our podcast, we'd love for you to go listen to it. If you know somebody that we should be talking to, tell us their name. If there's a topic we should be tackling, tell us, tell us about it. We have, um, Friday, we're going to meet with uh, the director of the YMCA. What's the YMCA doing to help families in need? Are there scholarships? What, what kind of programs do you offer? So just trying to get that out there to have the conversations to help our families. So if you want to contact us, here's all of our information. We're happy to talk to you if you want to tour of anything that we're doing. The southern and the states are under construction right now, but there's enough there you can actually see what those one, two, and three bedrooms look like. <laughs> We're also on social media, so anything Facebook, Twitter, X, now it's called Instagram, LinkedIn. We're on all of those pages, so if you're interested in any of that, I know the older you are, my kids don't get on Facebook anymore. It's like my thing. <laughs> and they're on everything else. They're like, Mom, you have to move this out a little bit because the younger people are not on certain things. So um, we're on all of that. And then, of course, our podcast, like she said, um, listen to it. It's really, we have great people that come on. I mean, I'm so touched every time we have a podcast. There's such great work going on in the person County, and I'm sure that it's going on in Salina as well. I mean, we don't know about it, obviously, but um, I know you have great people here. And so, yeah, contact us if you have a question or a concern or anything that we can do. To help. I'll try to keep an eye out for when we have a cottage that we have somebody exit. Mm -hmm. And if we don't immediately have somebody go in there, um, then I'll give you a holler. And do it for that. Depending on, um, yeah, maybe maybe this group could come down. Um, and we'd love to, like I said, we'd love to have you see them. A lot of times the comments we get, people will walk in there and go, well, I could live here. I could live here, could live here and be really happy with them. Not all that stuff is waiting for me in my house. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it's amazing. It's amazing the change that the apartment cottages has really done for our community. Because when someone comes to us living in their car, we can say, we have a place for you now. You don't have to go in a hotel. You don't have to go live in a normal shelter where you're in one room or, or whatever. We can take care of them immediately. Um, it, it's such a good feeling. I mean, I think people always show up in the office when I'm by myself and I'm like giving it a trying to find food and blankets because there's nothing else I can do. Sometimes I went to a place and, and gave up hotel rooms for, for my own money just because I couldn't stand it. You know, it was 100 degrees in the 
summer or where it was freezing cold. And we don't, I don't have to do that anymore. I can say, yes, we can help you. Here you go. Let's let's figure this out together and get you moving forward. It's just the most rewarding thing. We we do very we're very lucky we do very work work that's very rewarding and it's very it's incredible. What's the population of a person? Oh, we're just around 14,000, okay. somewhere between 13 and 14. I think the county is 30, 32,000, the whole county. We are countywide, it's just not the city of McPherson. We, right. we cover every inch in McPherson County. Yeah, I've got, <clears throat> I've got a family I work with in Mount Ridge. I've had families in Inman, um, Lindsburg, Marquette. I haven't had anybody in Wyndham. Wyndham's a very small community, um, and so they, they do have families, people that want to move there, but their problem is they don't really have the housing. Um, another thing that we've done, and we didn't put it on here, but we just spent two years working on a housing study that um, the goal is um, to figure out what housing is needed in all eight communities of Jefferson County. And then when we apply for grants, we want to apply in such a way that we can build houses in multiple communities at once. In Wyndham, their city um, clerk is part-time. Their mayor does her own stuff. She only comes when they have their meetings. Those folks do not know how to fill out a grant. And they probably can't compete against even the town of Canton. Canton is still a small community. But if these two go against each other, Canton's going to get back, not Wyndham. What we want to do is put housing in every one of the communities in McPherson County um, to help that community um, with their housing stock, help it to increase. Um, the other thing our housing study is doing is it's showing uh, what is the housing stock in your community. The man that, Marty, um, he did our housing study. He literally did a wheelchair, a windshield on his bicycle windshield or on his bicycle where he drove every road in the city and looked at the housing to decide does that one need to be condemned demolished and a new house built there or can that one be repurposed re renovated and save that house mm -hmm. um Lindsburg commented they have m many houses where the person that lived in that house is now at bethany home nursing home and maybe the kids live in across the country and they don't want this house, but they're not doing anything with this house. It's just sitting there. And um, so how do we deal with those kinds of situations in our communities? Because they're, they're everywhere. Um, so well, the other thing, one other thing that we do is we're very connected as far as the legislation at yeah. the state and the federal level because there's a lot of money there that Kansas is not receiving. So we've been having a fight to make sure that we bring that money to Kansas. If it's available out there, why are we not getting our fair share to fight this? So that's one of the things. We've actually been to Washington, D.C. and other people on a regular basis and say, hey, hey, we're not trying to force anything here, but we really need help, and we would like a piece of that pie. So the Sutherland Estates came about because of that very thing. We had, um, there was a competition through HUD and Kansas, every state was going for this money. Kansas was supposed to get $33 million to build housing in the, in the state. The agencies like us, we are a continuum of care. We work together across the state to try to house homeless people. And so they told us, they said, look, we need you, if you want to have a building development, we need you to put together a plan. We're going to put all those plans together and submit that for the state of Kansas. And there's $33 million that we should be able to get. Okay, great, so we'll do that. Well, we had 12 houses in our original plan. We brought all that stuff together. They said, guys, you're asking for 70,000, not 33. So we want to pare these down because if we can come in at that 33 million, then everybody will get their project. Okay, great. So we pared it down to seven. And we send this in. And when that was awarded, no building development got funding. They gave it to three organizations that are already bigger than us. And it was um, 
for administration. Administration, program. and it was what, 11 million? Well, we were supposed to get this huge amount, and we ended up with 1.5 million dollars. That's all, out of all that huge pocket of money, okay. we just got So for those five. three, so we called our federal representatives and senators, and we said, what happened? Wait, what's going on? What happened to the 33 million that Kansas was supposed to get? This is not right. They, we, you know, so then we went on about our business. It's another day. And probably three weeks later, uh, my email starts blowing up. I'm, it's on my phone and it's ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and I opened it up and they were saying, congratulations. And I told Chris, I said, when we get back to the office, I'm gonna open my email on my computer because I hate it on my phone. And HUD made it a special announcement Person Housing Coalition got 1.2 million dollars, mm -hmm. and only us, only we, got only we got building. No one else. So we don't really know so what happened. Yeah, what happened to the other 30 million dollars that Kansas was supposed to get? It went to <clears throat> other states with a larger homeless population. Okay, I get it. California, Chicago, New York, it's terrible. We don't want to get to that spot, so we need that money now. So we're not at the levels that these other states are. So any questions? Do you guys have any questions? That's awesome. So that's, so yeah, that's what gave that's us the money. Yes. 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 I was wondering uh, when you, like, for example, the little, little two-bedroom cottage is uh, fifty thousand dollars to build. Mm -hmm. um, does that include the value of volunteer labor? No, that's just the, that's what it costs. So the ones that we're building on the southern of the states, they're just over a little over a hundred thousand, hundred thousand, hundred. The two bedrooms are a hundred and fifteen. Yeah. The three bedrooms. A little four hundred and eighty. Well, they would be just a little uh, hundred fifty for a two bedroom, which are bigger. So just be a little over a hundred thousand dollars. So we didn't add all that in, but I was just talking about the co the actual cost, materials, material cost. Okay. Did that include the labor? So keep that in mind when you. When you think about the siding on these cottages, Certainty donated it. Those the siding on these cottages is twenty five thousand dollars per cottage by itself, not so, in the fifty thousand. So, so would be on top of that. Yeah, we didn't pay. Um, so this didn't siding pay. is made um, to go on homes that are on the east coast um, because of the storms and the salt and everything they have. And these were colors they weren't going to use anymore, so they discontinued it. So they gave it to us. And we got the siding for the Sutherland Estates is the same thing. So they gave it to us. Stanion Electric um, told us if it's an electrical component, send your electrician and you can have it for free. For free. So to, to clarify then, the, the, what you're saying that they cost does not include the in-kind donations? No. Wow. No. Vega, uh, gave us all the mana blocks and PEX piping. So a mana block, what's great about those is if there's a leak in the bathroom, you shut off the water to the bathroom, not the whole house. So they're amazing. I we started that. this project right in the middle. Do you remember when all the construction prices skyrocketed? Mm -hmm. That's when we decided to do this. In the middle of COVID, in the middle of all this crazy stuff going on. But because of the donations <coughs> and the free labor and the in-kind and all that, we were able to do it. And that's really what made this project. And, and it's great. I'm excited now that they're allowing, HUD is now allowing people to do this exact thing. And they come to our community. They've actually been here a couple times, and they're like, you did this how? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just mind-blowing yeah. to them that a community would come together. It's actually a million-dollar shelter mm -hmm. is what it is. If you talk about what it would cost and build if you were actually paying something, <coughs> it's a million-dollar facility. <coughs> what we tell them yeah. is, the, um, <coughs> you can go to a business and ask them to donate, but when you say, well, will you give me $50,000 and build a cottage, and by the way, can I have your workforce until it's built, and then can somebody come in and furnish it and decorate it? Yeah. And they'll go, are you nuts? Yeah. Let me give you side instead. Yeah. But you can go to the <coughs> churches and you can say, this is why we want to do it. These are the stories of the people that we're encountering. Can you give us the money to build it? Oh, and do you have the volunteer labor and the women to decorate? And they're like, sign us up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You have a question. I think you've been waiting a minute. Mm -hmm. Let me just say a couple things quick. Uh, in terms of, I think I understand that if they need, someone needed to go and, and 
and they fit your criteria uh, to emergency room or to a doctor, they get that free service. Yeah, correct. The CSBG funds we have will pay for that. So, I mean, the doctor doesn't give free service. Nope. No, we don't. Work. We haven't figured that part out. <laughs> <laughs> Grace Med, Grace Med. Um, if our clients go there, first of all, they are in a homeless shelter, so they charge twenty-five dollars per visit. If you are in a transitional or a homeless shelter situation, so you can come there and you can see the doctor, you can get medicine or whatever it is you need. There's a $25 visit. Whereas if you or I went there, I don't know. I have insurance, so I'm not sure how much they pay for me to go do that. That's more than $25. So what and then oh, one, one quick question. Um, you mentioned Salina housing and something about not didn't know much or whatever. I don't know. Do you have any connection with the, the housing? Issues here. We don't have any connections. We're only through McPherson County. We've talked mm -hmm. to different groups here. We've had groups come down from Salina. They're very interested in doing what we're doing. I just, I'm not sure why that hasn't taken hold yet. And this is kind of, it gets kind of complicated. Figure out how to build it. You've got to figure out how to fund it. You've got to figure out how to get staff and how everything to take the property. And I'm not quite sure that they have a group yet who's organized enough to make all that happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, this happened a long time after we've been around for a while, so this happened years later, so we kind of had everything in place to make it work. And that has to come first, your zoning, your all the things. Yeah. That was my question. Okay. How hard was it um, for you guys to get zoned for all these tiny houses? So, because I can see that being an issue. So, here. What happened was years ago, I had actually had it zoned for 12 units. I was going to do some other project, and the whole thing fell through. Thank goodness it fell through. Anyways, so I went to the, to the planning commission. I said, hey, I need you to do R3. And they said, fine, we'll do a 12-unit 12, 12 overlay, and then we'll go ahead and do this. Well, so when I decided to do this, mm -hmm. we were already zoned. Okay. Because neighbor, some of the neighbors were not happy with this project. You know, when you see a homeless shelter, a lot of times, you ever notice people mingling around outside, mm -hmm. and they don't have any place else to go, and they don't let them be there during the day, they can only be there at night. That doesn't happen here. We don't. That, that's never happening. If right. they're outside, they're on the porch playing with their kids. They're not mingling around because they have nothing else to do. And so, even though at the beginning I was yelled at a lot in the street, quite honestly, now they love it. As a matter of fact, this is probably better, the best thing in the neighborhood at this point. Mm -hmm. We're working with an artist right now who is developing some beautiful art to go throughout our project mm -hmm. and putting a butterfly garden in. And people are like, why do you spend so much money on all this extra stuff? Because I need people to feel like they matter. Because I want kids to say, I got to live there. Not that mm -hmm. I was forced to live there. Not that this was happening. We want to add to the healing of our families. And that's how you <coughs> create beautiful things. You maintain it. You have families work through the process. And then you get and then wonderful things start happening. The other thing is there's a lot of um, Habitat for Humanity housing in this particular neighborhood. Um, and so, um, I think, you know, it adds to the community, it doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. so. I admire both of you. Yeah, I'll thank you. Remarkable. So were you guys instrumental in getting the, uh, it used to be called Villa Row in Lindsburg, but it, all the little houses oh, yeah. that are, are now all pretty colors like that. Yeah, I know it wasn't us. Can't yeah. take any credit for it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. We love Lindsburg, by the way. We do yeah. love Lindsburg. My dad lives there, and I'm yeah. here. Four days a week. Yeah, they we feel like this could happen in every community. Mm -hmm. You need a homeless shelter. If you have homeless people, you need a homeless shelter. And it can't be this great big building no. where you put 100 beds and then you ask them to leave during the day and come back only at night. We watched that during COVID. It didn't work. You had 100 beds. All of a sudden, you've got 25 or 30 beds because everybody had to have their space. This, with this situation, it doesn't matter if there's a pandemic going on. It doesn't matter who's sick. You have your own space to be where you're safe. Your stuff is safe. Your, your belongings are safe. Mm -hmm. You can't, you now can have time to figure out what is my next step. We <clears throat> watched them come from not being able to make a decision to within a couple of weeks, they're able to come up with what their stability plan is going to look like. What are my steps to get out of where I am? What do I need to do next? What comes after that? Um, and they can actually think like you and I do when we make a plan. And people say, well, 
If they would just get a job, okay, that's not the problem. They can't even think about getting a job because they're trying to think about where they're going to sleep tonight or how am I going to feed my child tonight. So, do you have any more questions? Oh, oh I, I just invited you here. It sounds like uh, you're holding accountable. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a huge, essential. that's a huge part of it. So, yes. one thing that we we've had to learn. We did come see at the director at Ashby House here in Swanee mm -hmm. because we're like, okay, you're doing a shelter. We want to do a shelter, but we don't know what we're doing. So, um, so we visited about their rules and how they do what they're doing. <coughs> um, one of the very first. Um, moms that we had moved in here, she had two little kids, and um, you know, you're trying to work with them, you're trying to um, let them know that, you know, this is the rules, and um, so when she had a gentleman spend the night, the case manager went to her and said, look, this is an emergency shelter, we are trying to help you and your children, this cannot happen. Well, then a couple weeks later, the dad of the children showed up. Well, he's come this way, all this way to see the kids, so of course he spent the night. Sorry, Mary, that's mm -hmm. not what this is for. Mm -hmm. This is for you and it. So when it happened the third time, we had to say, Mary, I'm sorry, but you're not ready for what we're offering you here. And so as much as I hate to say it, I'm going to have to ask you to leave because every time you bring a gentleman overnight in my shelter, I don't know who this person is, mm -hmm. I don't know what their background <clears throat> is, and I'm dealing with people who are in trauma. And so I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Come back and see us when you're ready to put in the work for you and your kids. That's the hard part. That's, that's, that's the hard part. Done. They're probably not going to leave. Yeah, I know. We were worried about 45 minutes being <laughs> <laughs>